We've watched the body cam footage from the Hamas terrorists who invaded Israeli communities, read the horrifying stories of families murdered in their homes while waiting for help that never came. We've seen the photos, though we wish we hadn't. You know which ones. And now, we're seeing the response. More than 100 targets were hit in the Hamas-run enclave overnight. Ground invasion is imminent, and Israeli commandos have started conducting raids to target Hamas militants. The Israeli army has been shelling Gaza relentlessly in order to destroy Hamas's infrastructure once and for all. And even in the midst of our suffering, as first responders comb through the wreckage of Israeli communities and Israeli cemeteries hold funerals around the clock, we can't ignore the suffering in Gaza. So do we have to choose? Is it possible to support Israel's right to defend itself and remain empathetic to the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza? I want to make something clear. None of us outside of the situation have any ground to tell Israelis or Palestinians how to think about their own suffering. These are the people who actually live in the region, who are running from the rockets or airstrikes, who have attended too many funerals since October 7th. That gives them the right to decide and manage their own responses to the unimaginable trauma they've suffered and continue to suffer. This video is for those of us who are watching the horror unfold from hundreds or thousands of miles away. Those of us who are still trying to manage our reaction to the constant onslaught of terrible news. Young people came here for a party, for a celebration, and then they were slaughtered. The situation with the hostages, they say there are around 200 in total. They say about 10% of them are children under the age of 18. If you've taken to social media to try and make sense of what is happening, you've seen someone justify the indiscriminate and barbaric murder of over a thousand Israeli civilians. Resistance is justified! The hot takes are everywhere, and each is more deranged than the next. First, it was Then it was, this is what decolonization looks like. It was exhilarating, it was energizing. Then, it was, Israel is lying about the atrocities perpetrated by Hamas. And the inevitable conclusion, swastikas at rallies, cries of gas the Jews, kill a settler spray painted on buildings. I'm not going to address those takes. None of us have the time or energy to entertain the profound moral rot at the heart of these reactions. This is hateful, denialist garbage. But some people are asking important questions. Even as we condemn the massacre in Israel in the strongest terms, many people are wondering, why should the Palestinians of Gaza have to pay? Why is Israel making them suffer? And you know what? These are fair questions. Because if you've been paying attention for the past couple of decades, you probably already know the Palestinians in Gaza have not had it easy. And that's an understatement. Hamas, a Sunni movement, won Palestinian elections in 2006. In the end, Hamas won control of Gaza, and its grip on the enclave of around 2 million people tightened, as Israel and Egypt largely sealed it off, causing intense humanitarian problems. Now, I don't want to push this narrative that Palestinians are nothing but victims, that they don't have any joy or resilience or agency. That is utterly false. Like any other group of people, Palestinians are human beings who manage to find joy, purpose, and meaning, even in difficult circumstances. So when I say that they've had it tough, I'm stating a fact, not dismissing their agency or resilience. Because the fact is, life in Gaza is tough. It is a tiny, densely populated strip of land where two million people live in crowded conditions with very little freedom. Half of the population is under 18 years old, and that means they lived under Hamas their entire lives. They have attended Hamas schools and summer camps, surrounded by Hamas propaganda. Ahmed Ibrahim is being taught how to put together a rifle. He'll also learn how to look after it and how to use it. Ahmed is a new recruit to a youth military program being run by the government of Hamas. They lived through multiple wars with Israel. And they are surrounded by poverty, crumbling infrastructure, and food insecurity. The average Gazan lives on $13 a day. And that's if they're lucky enough to be employed, which many, many Gazans aren't. Since 2007, both Egypt and Israel have imposed blockades on the Strip. 
The intensity of those blockades depends on the year and each country's political situation. For obvious reasons, the blockades go stricter during times of war. But even in times of relative peace, both Egypt and Israel regulate everything that enters and exits Gaza, including people. The thousands of Gazans who cross into Israel every day for work or medical treatment need permits to do so. But those Palestinians who wish to cross into the West Bank or to leave the Strip entirely for a trip abroad need permission from Egyptian, Palestinian, and or Israeli authorities, depending on where they're trying to go and through which exit. And as you might imagine, that severely limits their employment and educational prospects, not to mention the quality of life. It's not just the land routes that are blocked. Gaza has no airport or seaport. In short, Gazans are effectively trapped, and life in the Strip is not pleasant. Hamas, the political party that runs Gaza, is considered a terrorist group by over a dozen countries, including the US, and their terror is not limited to Israelis. Hamas steals aid meant for ordinary Gazans, pilfers humanitarian supplies, and silences any citizens that try to protest. Innocent Palestinians are routinely killed by the rockets shot from within Gaza towards Israel. CNN just got its hands on unclassified U.S. intelligence that shows that it was a misfired Palestinian rocket that caused the explosion at the Gaza hospital on Tuesday. In short, ordinary Palestinians have suffered greatly since they elected Hamas in 2006. That was nearly two decades ago. Hamas has not held a single election since. For that matter, neither has the PA in the West Bank. But that's a different story. And that means that over half of Gaza wasn't even born when their parents or grandparents elected Hamas. So while there is no justification for Hamas's slaughter of Israeli civilians on October 7th, you would be absolutely forgiven for asking, why should ordinary Palestinians, who have already suffered so much, have to pay? And the answer isn't comfortable, it isn't pleasant, and it isn't fair. The Israeli government once hoped that Hamas might be, well, not a partner for peace, but a stable if unpleasant neighbor. After all, the terrorist group revised its genocidal charter in 2017, removing the more blatant anti-Semitism and seeming to accept a Palestinian state within the 1967 borders. This is the message actually um, crystal clear to, to the people in the West, to the world community that this is Hamas. And I think now they will say, now we can make business with the movement. And for the past couple of years, Hamas's negotiations with Israel centered mostly on ways to ease Gaza's dire economic distress, a distress they themselves have facilitated by funneling Gaza's aid money into terror. But in the wake of October 7th, Israel has realized, in the most shocking and bloody way possible, that Hamas's apparent desire for stability was a smokescreen, and Israelis paid dearly for that false sense of security. The terrorists that poured into Israel on October 7th had clear directions from the top brass. Murder, torture, kidnap. Fueled by cheap amphetamines, they fulfilled their instructions with savage glee. I won't repeat the things that they did to their victims. It's too graphic. But you don't have to take my word for it. Because perversely, they recorded and uploaded their crimes. I don't recommend searching for these videos, by the way. They're horrific. The Israeli response was swift and unambiguous. They promised to root out Hamas's fighters, to destroy their infrastructure, to target their leadership, and to banish them from Gaza, ensuring that Israel's borders are safe. The aim is understandable, even justified. Hamas tortures its own civilians, uses innocent people as human shields. Hamas is willing to use innocent civilians as essentially human shields. That's exactly what we saw with ISIS. And rips up Gaza's water pipes to create rockets. They've spent the past 17 years destroying Gaza from the inside out. And they're hell-bent on even more destruction because their ultimate goal is to establish a state free of Zionism and treacherous Christianity, just like ISIS. 510 million kilometers مربع. And as we've seen time and again, they will use violence to do it. And that's why the Israeli army is currently bombing Gaza. That is why they're targeting Hamas leadership. That is why they're warning Palestinian civilians to flee. That is why they're preparing a ground assault. Not because they hate Palestinians, not because they want Palestinians to suffer, not because they're out for revenge, but because Israel now insists 
This will be the last time that Hamas will be allowed to murder innocent civilians, to take hostages, to commit human rights atrocities, and to threaten its own people. Hamas started a war, and Israel is going to finish it. War is devastating and unfair and ugly. But it's the only way to ensure that any of the people living in the Holy Land, whether in Israel or in Gaza, have a shot at a future that is free of terror, destruction, and blood.